Ladies and gentlemen, it's a real pleasure to be here this evening. Uh, I have visited uh, IST several times. I have listened to several very interesting lectures in this hall, but I never had the opportunity to, to speak, so I'm uh, really happy uh, that I uh, got the invitation. And, and actually, the, the, this paper that was uh, just mentioned, uh, I'm at the moment at the, the process of, of rethinking and indeed how to remove the question mark uh, and uh, so summarizing the scientific evidence uh, that we had in the meantime. And uh, so the, in a way, this uh, whole lecture this evening can be seen as presenting some, some new, some additional scientific evidence, uh, highlighting the, the importance of human capital, which is the uh, sort of its basic education and basic health. Essentially, of course, with education, also the, the more advanced uh, uh, education matters, but for the global development is really the decisive uh, step is from illiteracy to, to basic education, as I will show. Well, a lot has been said about my uh, different affiliations, and the, all you see all the logos here where the Wittgenstein Center is sort of a common roof. We now have a, a group of about 60 uh, scientists uh, in these three uh, groups uh, together. Uh, we are always uh, impressed uh, with uh, IST uh, in terms of the statistics of the ERC grants, and you just got, I think, two new ones, and actually our institute also got uh, a new one, and so we have now seven, which is actually in Austria quite good for a small social science institute. There uh, are not too many of this sort. Now, what will I be talking about today? It's, uh, first, I will say a few words what the discipline of demography tries to do, and then we'll have the focus on the global population trend and in particular on, on the human capital, which is just not the number of people only, but it's sort of uh, their education, their skills. And then I talk about the concept of a demographic metabolism, which uh, recently is a generalization of some of the demographic processes that really is a predictive theory. We don't have many predictive theories in the social sciences, but I think that is one, and we talk a little about this. Then more generally, uh, how does uh, the education or cognition more generally uh, is related uh, to development and economic development, but also to health. And uh, my own uh, ERC advance grant for the last five years was on using demographic to methods to forecast the adaptive capacity of societies to already unavoidable climate change. So there's a lot of uh, modeling about what is the future climate, but then many people naively assume that the future climate will meet the societies of today. But of course, societies are also changing, and we try to get an analytical handle to model the societal change. And when we talk about a set of scenarios, these shared socioeconomic pathways that the IPCC, the global climate change community, is using, and uh, then uh, we will conclude with some policy-relevant discussions about the Sustainable Development Goals, which is the new set, the new consensus of the world leaders, the development agenda from 2015 to 2030. Okay, um, so demography. Well, when I went to the, the U.S. Uh, uh, to study it, and actually uh, Gustav Feichtinger, one of my teachers here, and he was a professor at the TU in operations research, then actually uh, strongly recommended when I came as a young student to him saying that uh, I want to study demography, but he thought quickly, don't try to do it in the German-speaking world, go to the, the best people in the US, and he recommended me, particularly the University of Pennsylvania, and then I was admitted and went there. So it, how we define it, well, um, my favorite definition is it's the mathematics of groups of people. So it's not so much individual behavior, there can be mathematical models about groups of people. What is a group? Well, it can be national population, it can be subpopulations, however we define it. And we, we're modeling the, the change over time, the changing size, but in particular the changing composition. And of course there's also animal demography, uh, which does similar things for animal species, but the specifics of, of human demography is really that we have 
a sort of conscious decision making as an important factor and the ability to actively influence our environment and our behavior. So human populations, as any population, uh, changes essentially through three processes. It's uh, birth, or the process called fertility, the analysis of drivers and the forms of fertility. Uh, then some people disappear through death, uh, mortality, and other people disappear or enter a whatever defined national population or other through migration, movement in and out of the population under consideration. So these are the three basic uh, demographic uh, fields. Uh, they have all our big research communities in themselves. But there is a, a recent generalization of what is called multidimensional demography or multi-state demography that actually started in the 1970s at YASA uh, when Andre Rogers and Nathan Keefe, the uh, retired Harvard professor, came there in, in 1984 to take over the leadership of the World Population Program. Uh, they really uh, introduced these methods and I was fortunate then to, change, to join him in 85 and then when he finally retired at the age of 75, I think, went back to Cambridge, Massachusetts and took over the leadership of the World Population Program. And this multidimensional, they subdivide the population into further categories. So not only the conventional age and sex structure of the population, uh, but uh, we have uh, education structures, I will show, uh, there can be labor force participation, there can be place of residence, urban, rural, ethnic structures or whatever. And then of course we, it gets more complicated, we need the transitions between these subpopulations, but then also have sort of subgroup specific fertility, mortality and migration. Uh, there's also something called population studies, uh, which is a somewhat broader field that also analyzes uh, the determinants and the consequences of population trends, whereas the demography uh, does more sort of the technical uh, analysis of the processes themselves. Well, let's look at the broad picture here. See the world population over the last uh, 1,000 years, sort of throughout human history. As you know, there were not so many human beings. Actually, sometimes the human species was really threatened by extinction. And uh, it was only uh, in the... Yeah, after the medieval ages that the world population increased to about half a billion. And then as you see here, real world population growth only took off in the middle of the 19th century when the death rates fell first in Europe and, and then after World War II uh, in, the, in the developing countries. So that's why today we are about 7.3 billion people on this planet and these are some uh, possible future pathways, some an uncertain distribution and we'll zoom uh, into this in a moment. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty, depends essentially on the future of fertility. Uh, so at YASA we've been uh, working on uh, the methods of uh, probabilistic population projections. We were the first to apply this on a global scale and you see if you look at the titles of these three articles in Nature over a, a decade, uh, they also reflect the changing concern about population. So in in the mid-1990s, when everybody talked about a certain doubling of world population, with these probabilistic projections, we would say doubling of world population, unlikely. It's still going to grow, but it's not a high probability it will double. And then in 2001, there's a very frequently cited paper, the end of world population growth. But we say there is a high chance that over the course of the 21st century, world population will peak and start to slightly decline, as you see here in this uh, graph here. So the red line is, is the median, and where half of the simulated cases are above and below, but there's a big uncertainty range about it. And then a 2008 paper focused on what is now dominating the discussion in, in many low fertility countries, in most industrialized countries, is the coming acceleration of global population aging. So let's talk a bit more of this. I mean, world population growth has seen a, a lot of discussions, sometimes very polemic discussions, and it is sometimes called the elephant in the room uh, because it is often not explicitly mentioned in international fora. Uh, the Sustainable Development Goals uh, recently accepted a good example. The population is not mentioned in any of these 169 targets. Also, many scientists, and in particular ecologists, tend to think it's terribly important and is really one of the main challenges of um, the future. Uh, why is it important? 
Well, uh, it's the sheer number of consumers and their impact on the environment. So if there is sort of a, at a given level of per capita consumption and technology, uh, then of course more people are more consumer, more negative impact on the environment. Um, also, if you have more social development perspective and are concerned about expanding education, improving health or reducing poverty, well, if the population, as it does in many African countries these days, grows by two or more percent per year, uh, this really becomes an uphill battle. I mean, as you're expanding a school system, the young population grows, may grow even faster. Um, through more people also increase the vulnerability and uh, the exposure to natural disasters uh, in the context of climate change or other environmental change. And that's particularly worrisome that the, the coastal areas, which are the most vulnerable to sea level rise or to tropical storms, and so that's where the population are growing most rapidly all around the world. And then there's a big literature and political science uh, that indeed rapid population growth and a shortage of land uh, is uh, increasing the likelihood of conflict and, in a consequence, uncontrolled mass migration, which is, of course, a big concern these days in Europe as well. So uh, there's controversies and questions about each of these, but at least there is a lot of uh, mentioning of population growth as a potential threat to future human well-being. Why are we relatively certain that the world population growth will sooner or later come to an end with a sort of level up, as I said, the end of world population growth? And there is one uh, theoretical construct, or some people call it a theory, and I think it could be called a theory because it does have some predictive power. Uh, that is this universal process of demographic modernization or demographic transition, where now we see that different populations in different parts of the world are at different stages of the same process. In a way, Africa is going to a very similar process uh, to what uh, here in Austria or Central Europe, we went through uh, late 19th, early 20th century, and then some of the East Asian countries went through in the mid 20th century. So it's the same process of first declining uh, death rates and then declining birth rates. But since the timing is not the same, uh, for that reason, we today live in a demographically divided world. And this really confuses many commentators that in parts of the world, population growth is the main concern. I mentioned Africa, where it really should be still a main concern, whereas in others, particularly in Europe and in East Asia, Japan also being a good example, population aging is a big concern for the future. Uh, so we don't have time. There's a big literature on this uh, demographic transition, but generally it is first that the death rates fall. Why do they start to fall? Because throughout human history there have been fluctuations in birth rates and death rates, and on average the birth rates were about the same level of the death rates, sometimes a little higher, and then the population grew. But then this is the Malthusian model. If the population grows, then after a while they are running out of food supply, and then the death rates catch up again, and, and uh, sort of kill people off again, and there is sort of a Malthusian equilibrium. But then there was a period, it started really in Sweden and uh, other Nordic countries in the middle of the 19th century, uh, that death rates started to fall in a sustainable manner. They, they then remained low, they never came back up to this high level. There is some controversy about the specific reasons. It clearly has to do with better sanitation. There were some early forms of smallpox vaccination there. Uh, better uh, nutrition, uh, yeah, clean drinking water. You may remember the famous Hochwellwasserleitung in Wien. That is, we really can see in the cholera death statistics of Vienna when it was opened. I think it was uh, 1871. Then it was really the death rate fell, and then two years after the opening, it had to be closed again for repairs. The cholera death went up again, and there's this very strong association between clean drinking water and death rates. And then, but the birth rates initially remain high uh, because there uh, is uh, fertility, high fertility, pro-natalist uh, attitudes are embedded in many religions and cultures because in order to prevent extinction, you need to have many children and uh, it takes decades, if not longer, for individual couples and societies to understand that now with lower child mortality, they don't have to aim so high to have a certain number of surviving children. In this phase where the 
Birth rates are still high and the death rates are really low. That's where we have high population growth. That's what we had in, uh, in Europe in the, around the early 20th century where millions of Europeans who didn't find a living here in Europe migrated overseas. And that's what we have in the Middle East and in Africa today, also with millions of people on the move. But unlike uh, Europeans in the early 20th century, no continent wants to take them. And that is also a, another historical situation. OK, and in the end of the demographic transition, then the birth rates also fall. And this may lead uh, to situations where we have very low or even negative population growth. So in most European countries, you actually would already have low pop negative population growth unless migration would compensate. And that's why, for instance, in Austria and Germany, the populations are still growing somewhat. And uh, some of our research has been really behind the drivers of this uh, general development. Uh, if female education plays a decisive role, both in terms of the mortality decline as well as fertility decline. But of course, there are many institutional and also economic factors playing a role. Now let's step back a little and sort of what we've been doing in Yaza over the last decades in this multidimensional demography is really trying to adding education to age and sex and population dynamics. And this is based on the insight that education uh, could, could justifiably be called the most important source of observable population heterogeneity after age and sex. Of course, age and sex matter. They are sort of all physiologically determined uh, aspects of our behavior. And there are many other unobservable heterogeneity. All of us here in the room are different in one way or the other. Um, but uh, the question is, which are sort of generalizable, observable patterns of heterogeneity? And this matters for two different reasons. Uh, the, the one is that, of course, uh, the always uh, uh, heterogeneous population uh, has a different dynamics if the different subpopulations have different fertility, mortality, and migration rates, which they do have uh, in, in, with respect to education. And therefore, changing education composition also changes the population forecast. It changes population dynamics. And then, of course, education is very important in itself as a crucial determinant of individual empowerment and human capital. It is a key driver of socioeconomic development, ranging from the public health to economic growth to the quality of institutions and democracy, we'll see an example. And finally, to adaptive capacity to climate change. A word on measurement, uh, human capital. In German, the word humankapital is not a favorite word. It's, it, in one year, it was actually elected as the Unwort des Jahres, the least favorite word, because it somehow implies that humans are measured in, in monetary terms. And therefore, in German, I usually say human resources. But if in English you say human resources, they say, well, there's a personnel department on the second floor. <laughs> so in, in English, the word human capital is less problematic and, and preferred. It has the education and, to some extent, uh, the health component. Uh, but if we focus on the education, again, it's important to distinguish between formal education, that's what happens in school, and informal education, that's all other learning, which may be equally important or more important that happens outside the school. But even if we focus on formal education only, we have the quantity, that's the years of schooling, that's the degrees you get. But very important also is the quality. That's, for instance, what the PISA studies try to measure, uh, how much reading and mathematics uh, do these youngsters actually learn in school. And then there's also the question of content, particularly at higher levels of education. Are you getting a more technical and more natural science education, a more humanistic or whatever? And of course, that matters also. Uh, how do we measure education? Uh, if you look at the education literature, 98%, uh, I would say, uh, focus on what we call the education flows. That is what happens in the school. It's uh, pedagogics, and that's the policy variable. How many people are involved enrolled in school, and what do they learn? Uh, from a demographic perspective, when we talk about human capital, then we have a look at the education stocks. That's people who already come out of school. That's the adults. What are the skills? What is the educational attainment of the adult population? Who is working? And it's uh, very closely linked to the productivity of the labor force. And as with any stock, they change very slowly. They have a great momentum. And demographic methods are very appropriate for modeling these stocks. 
Uh, how do we measure these stocks? Well, the economists prefer sort of a single number, the mean years of schooling of the population. Um, we prefer to have a, a richer set of information, namely the full distribution by age and sex and highest level of educational attainment. And that's sort of what the world looks like today. Uh, so we probably all have seen an age pyramid where we have uh, cohorts sorted by age groups. So the youngest at the bottom, the oldest at the top. And then on the right, we have the women. And on the left, we have the men. And now we have a third dimension here, which is highest level of educational attainment. You see, uh, still today, about a billion people on this planet are in red. They've never seen a school from inside. They have no schooling whatsoever. And then you have the, the yellow. Those are those that have some uh, primary schooling. Then the biggest area on the global level at the moment is light blue. Uh, that is junior secondary education and some senior secondary education. And then those who have post-secondary education or university education, that's the dark blue. So you see an a education pyramid. And of course, there are big regional differences in this. The world was not always like this. And if we go and we reconstructed for all countries in the world these education distributions back to 1970. So this was the world in 1970. You see among the women, almost half of the women at that time had never seen a school from inside. They had never had the opportunity to go to school. With men, they were a little better educated because in many countries there is a preferential schooling given to boys. Also, the course of development is changes, as we will see. Uh, and there has been very little tertiary education. So, um, you may not even, uh, I'm looking at statistics, even in Austria and Germany, after World War II, there were less than one or two percent of the entire population had uh, matura or abitur, uh, high school graduation. So, they really, the masses of the population had uh, a very low education. And in the developing countries, like in Africa, essentially, no education at all. Uh, there is one country that I'm particularly interested in because it's a fascinating, uh, it's not only the richest country in the world, but it's also one of the most rapidly developing countries in the world. And I happen to, to live uh, there for some time as a, as a visiting professor recently. And the one thing is, is, many of you may have been in Singapore, really the most modern city that you can imagine. And if you look at the young cohorts, it's also the best educated young age groups. 80% of young men and women have post-secondary education there. But then often, I'm sure what you've done it, you go around the corner, and there of all you find yourself in, in like in a poor Asian country. It's like old Chinese men sitting around, not speaking any English. And um, well, there are still these red people there. In the richest country in the world today, you find people who have never been to school. How can this be? Well, this is the demographic metabolism. It's the momentum of demographic. Uh, stocks, if we go back to Singapore in 1970, then they had just started to uh, educate their population. In 1950, really, Singapore was an absolutely poor and desperate country with almost 80% illiteracy, uh, malaria, hell. It was one of the least favorite places on this planet to be. Uh, but then they've started massive education campaigns. And you see by 1970, already the young ones uh, had... Um, some secondary education. Again, you see that the education first uh, prefers boys, but then in the later phases, the, the girls catch up. Uh, so as you see again in 1970, uh, the vast majority of women above age 30 had never been to school. And now we go in 10 year steps. This is Singapore 1980. This is really where you see now the better educated cohorts coming in the young adult ages onto the labor market. And this is when really economic growth took off in Singapore, where Singapore managed within only seven years to eradicate malaria. And, and many of the positive things happened there as the better educated cohorts moved up the age pyramid. 1990, now the tertiary education really starts to expand. But you see still the elderly, the majority have never been to school because they don't go back to school once they are beyond school age. 19 2000, now you see really almost more, more than half of the young already educated, but still this uneducated elderly who also are very poor elderly and uh, have different jobs. So, so it's really all these things that vary with education, changing society. And that is this, uh, what we call the demographic metabolism, is that the intergenerational change that we can model as these new different cohorts move up the age pyramid. 
And education is, by definition, a stable characteristic. Once you get a degree in the university, nobody's going to take it away from you. And after a certain age, you are not adding. Uh, there are other things, and we've done studies, let's say, on the feeling of European identity or uh, tolerance towards homosexuality, some, some values that also tend to be rather persistent. They are formed at young age and then stay uh, rather sticky along the cohort lines. And uh, this model of cohort replacement of demographic metabolism can also be used there. So we go up uh, 2010, and then we can, of course, extend it into the future. This is the basis for population projections. So we can sort of uh, go back down to 1970 and go back up here and see how society, Singapore today, is really a completely different population than it was in 1970 because the young cohorts are slowly moving up. So it takes about a half century uh, really for these radical changes in society and uh, it's hard to think of any other country, maybe South Korea had a similar speed of expansion. And, and China is, is following and uh, uh, other Asian countries as well, Thailand and uh, maybe the Indonesia, uh, and, but Africa is really just only starting on this process. Okay, here we go back to the world in, in 2060. Just show we talk a little more about global projections later on, but this is sort of the medium case for the world. We're still going to have some completely uneducated, but it's a small minority now, and you see the expansion uh, if the trend continues of secondary, in particular, tertiary educated people. Men and women, almost the same. Now, what is the, the education effect? I think it's worth resting a little and stepping back because many economists think that education doesn't really change you. It's something that's assigned to you. It's sort of a self-sorting. And in most social science studies, uh, education is just seen as a proxy of socioeconomic status. Could be income, could be education, could be social class. Uh, so that's for this reason we've really focused quite a bit recently of what we call functional causality, from education to, to health and to fertility. In the social science, it's almost impossible to prove hard causality that always under all conditions uh, A leads to B. Uh, but uh, we've uh, defined criteria of when it is worthwhile talking about functional causality, when we have a strong association, and there is a plausible narrative how A influences B, and we also can rule out other uh, explanations such as reverse causality or selectivity. Um, another thing is that also conventional demographers are talking about age and sex. These are really sort of biological characteristics, whereas education is just a social construction. Well, our institute recently we've done work to show that age really isn't what it used to be. Yeah, and that we don't have time, but it's very clearly we can show that now uh, 60 is the new 50 in a way. 60-year-old people today are as healthy, have the same remaining life expectancy, in many respects similar to 50-year-old people 30 years ago. And in 30 years, probably 70 is going to be the new 50. So age is changing, the meaning of age is changing. Uh, also in gender, uh, is tipped, increasingly people talk about a third a sex or just think of uh, Conchita Wurst and uh, other aspects where it's not really, there's no clearly defined biological sex. And education also has some physiological, some biological uh, aspects. So both three of them have elements of social construction as well as physiological elements. So what's the uh, biological aspect of education? I had the opportunity to quite some interaction with Eric Kandel. Many of you may know him as the Vienna-born Nobel laureate in medicine for his work on brain research. And uh, he's been, uh, well, I was speaking together with him on a panel of the Austrian Science Day in New York, but he also frequently visited uh, Vienna. And at one of the, when I was together on the podium with him talking about these things, he said, of course, every learning experience adds new synapses to our brains. And particularly if we repeat the point for a second and a third time, then it's stuck there for the rest of our life. You can't get rid of it. And every learning experience builds on this. So in other words, if you walk out through this door, now you are physiologically a different person than when you entered because you've learned something and that is hardwired in your brains. So that is also a true and real embodied effect of education. 
So what does it do in our behavior? Well, it, it enhances cognitive skills in many respects. There's good evidence that it changes towards less risky behavior. Uh, it extends the personal planning horizon. Uh, you learn much faster from past damage. Uh, also, you can anticipate the uh, not yet experienced or the counterfactual you can imagine and take better preparations. So there are many strengths uh, that education adds that allow you to better manage your future and improve your health. Uh, but of course, uh, being able to read and write also gives you better access to relevant information. And uh, as I said, it improves your health and physical well-being, which again can also lead to higher income. Now, I'm not going to show you any matrices and formulas, just here a picture that says essentially what do we do when we do these multidimensional population projections. Let's assume to the left we have a population pyramid by let's say, a level of education in 2000 and want to project it to the year 2005. Well, since we have five-year age groups, the one is over these five years, everybody is going to be five years older. So we shift the pyramid up one step. But then, of course, some people are going to die between 2000 and 2005. So we have age-specific and sex-specific and now also education-specific mortality rates. They are being applied to all of these categories. But then if we shift it up, there is not going to be a youngest age group. So where do the children come from? Well, the children are uh, derived by applying age-specific fertility rates, also education-specific, to women in reproductive age. This is these violet norms, and they build the babies uh, of the next coming years. And then we also apply infant mortality, and that if we got the youngest age group, zero to five. And then, of course, there's migration coming in and out. The migration is also age, sex, and education-specific. But it's also a big matrix that we uh, sort of, it's essentially a Markov process as we move them up in time. Now, um, what do we do, assume, in terms of uh, future trends? Here we have uh, empirical data for education differentials by uh, fertility by education in Kenya. So in 2000, uh, these are the empirical data where we see that women who in Kenya never been to school, they have on average more than six children, and then it goes really clearly down uh, to those who have been uh, some uh, upper secondary school, they have three children, those with post-secondary education, they have less than two and a half children. And the green line uh, is sort of the, the average, the national level. And then we have some assumptions about, uh, and this is based on complex models, as on expert opinion as well, how these education-specific fertility rates change uh, over time. But what I'm saying here is that the, the green line, sort of the aggregate population fertility, depends on the relative on the weight of these uh, different education groups. So if the population educates more rapidly, the green line will be pulled down towards the blue, towards the higher education group. If there's a stagnation in education, the green line, the overall fertility, will be closer uh, to the higher fertility rates. Uh, well, we've uh, recently had a review article in Science where we talked about this integrating education and population, and there we presented two extreme scenarios. So keeping this set of education-specific fertility rates, as I've just showed you, except for the green line, constant, the same for all countries in the world. And then the scenario of constant enrollment numbers. This is the most pessimistic schooling. We build no new schools. We sort of freeze uh, the school population, uh, that results in a very rapid population growth. So the educational structure does not improve anymore, and the world population would already reach 10 billion by the middle of the century. And then we have the fast track scenario uh, that is the most optimistic one, essentially assuming that all countries of the world, including those in Africa, would enter next year in a, sort of a Singapore-style education expansion. And then you see, of course, the population is going to be much better educated. There still is this momentum. It takes decades to play out. Uh, but as a consequence purely of education, uh, the world population is going to be less than 9 billion. So there's more than 1 billion already by mid-century, a difference completely due uh, to education improvements. Well, let's move to the, so this was the heterogeneity of population forecasting. Now the consequences. Using this... Uh, reconstructions of education-specific fertility for all countries in the world. Uh, we've now uh, then uh, revisited the issue of um, human capital as a driver of economic growth and could show that indeed 
it, uh, the literature that was quite confused up to that date uh, showed to be a very consistent positive and significant coefficients for education. And we also showed what's written here in green, uh, that for a country to come out of poverty, uh, universal primary education is not good enough. And that was the time when the Millennium Development Goals only focused on universal primary education. But you need to have broad-based secondary education, at least junior secondary education as well. So then we were really very happy to see that now, last year, the new Sustainable Development Goals, they have Goal 4 on education, added secondary education. They focused on quality primary and secondary education for all girls and boys, and this is really clearly shown in this empirical analysis. Let's move to another issue, health. Health is the most highly, most appreciated um, aspect of life almost every country of the world. Here you see the Austrian Health Survey. Uh, what we uh, measure here is disability of activities of daily life, the so-called dailies, where they ask, are you able to cook yourself or climb the stairs and so on. And it's true, of course, that there is a rapid increase in disabilities with age, but we see these huge differentials. If you look, for instance, at uh, uh, women aged uh, 70 to 75, well, if they have... Uh, especially with the university education, uh, their prevalence of disability is less than half that of women who only have basic education. So there's these huge differences, and therefore also the, the outlook for future disability in an aging society is less dramatic than is most assumed because we know that the future elderly are going to be better educated than today's elderly, and the more better educated have a lower prevalence of disability. Now let's uh, come uh, to uh, future mortality of selected populations, and this is in a way a, a fun story, but uh, we did uh, because we have good historical data for many academies of sciences. And so we looked at the survival of members of the Austrian Academy of Sciences, some of my colleagues at the Institute, uh, you have the life expectancy at the age of 60, and compare it to that of the general population. And we have long time series. So maybe to your surprise, you see that the members of the Austrian Academy of Sciences up to 1950 had essentially no advantage in life expectancy as compared to the total population. Why? Well, it was infectious diseases uh, that affected this, and actually urban life was more risky than rural life. And this was despite the fact that some of the world's most famous doctors were members of the Austrian Academy of Science. It didn't help them very much with their own survival. Uh, but the thing changed around 1950. You see, for the uh, total population after 75, there was a clear upward trend, about five additional years in life expectancy at the age of 60. By the way, this is only men, because essentially only men were members of the Academy of Sciences. <laughs> so we, we, could, we should need to uh, compare it uh, to the male population of Austria. And now what you see here is the people with academic degree. All the people who have a university degree, they have on average another two years of additional life expectancy. But look at the academicians. They get another bonus of three years of uh, life expectancy. So it's sort of five years better than the average population. Uh, we have been uh, sort of thinking why this uh, is the case. And the most plausible is not a privilege with medical treatment and so on, but it really is a continued mental activity at high age. That keeps you alive and that keeps you engaged. And, uh, of course, this is not only true for people who happen to be elected to the academy, which often is like a lottery, but it's uh, rather, uh, for all of the scientists, I guess, here in the room, if you continue to work your brains until high age, this will also increase your life expectancy. Well, what about other desirable things like democracy? We had a series of studies where we looked at the institutional advantages, uh, that education indeed is a key factor enhancing demography. democracy. We find this, and we do a very bold application to the case of Iran, because you may not know Iran has seen a tremendous expansion of education and the world's most rapid fertility decline over the last years. And uh, given the strong global association between education and democracy, we dare to make uh, the prediction that there is a high chance, of course it's not a deterministic but a stochastic prediction, uh, that in the near future uh, Iran will move into a modern democracy. And uh, if you look at the, my co-authors, it's one of the leading Iranian demographers, Mohammed Charal, 
and a Spanish demographer, Jesus Crespo. And he said, if you're both Jesus and Mohammed as co-authors, it, it can't be wrong. <laughs> the last uh, topic, a very difficult one, is uh, uh, the interaction between human population and climate change. A lot has been written, and we've already talked about this, how more people have more consumption, uh, increase the greenhouse gases, and enhance climate change. But the solution in terms of mitigation also needs to come from us through innovation, new technologies, cleaner technologies. But uh, we are not only causing climate change, we the humans are also affected by climate change and that's why this is, 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 we are concerned about this. And, and here we know far too little what is very clear that there is differential vulnerability. Not every person in the same place is equally affected. There are differences by age, by education, by gender. And, and of course, that affects the livelihood. It may lead to out-migration, a very difficult topic. But, but we really have to look at the full circle. And particularly on this right-hand side, this was the, the topic of this ERC grant that I mentioned, uh, where we studied in more detail uh, what are the differential exposures to to risk and it more educated, they really have a higher risk awareness and understanding of the disaster, a high degree of preparedness, and starting already to live in low risk areas. Then during the disaster, they better understand the warning messages. We looked at some of the tsunamis and, uh, and the tropical storms, and everywhere we find is that the, the better educated react more properly and as you should be doing. And, uh, and then after the, after the disaster also, they, they recover much faster, they, uh, they have a faster learning potential and even they uh, can overcome their trauma more rapidly. And some of these findings that uh, we've recently summarized in a, in a policy forum in science uh, with you sort of what should be our priorities for enhancing the adaptive capacity to climate change. You see here, uh, you may know there is a fund, the global community has agreed by 2020 for annually spending 1 billion US dollars. That's quite a lot of money, one bi 100 billion, sorry, 100 billion US dollars per year on uh, this Green Climate Fund uh, helping in the, uh, developing countries with coping with climate change. So far, this money goes all to some engineering projects, sea walls, other things to protect. And in this, we show that actually much of the money may be better educated, better invested in educating uh, people to flexibly react uh, when the disaster strikes. Uh, so Science Magazine has added this subtitle, Fund More Educators, rather than just engineers. And I got many angry calls from engineers. And I had to point out that it's not all the money should go to educators, but rather than just engineers, they should not get all the money. Well, uh, we're really running out of time now. Uh, this is this new framework of the international climate change community uh, to model the socioeconomic challenges for mitigation as well as adaptation called the SSPs. And sort of this is the SSP2, which is also our most likely, most probable world population pattern by level of education. You see from 1970 to where we are now. And uh, then the likely peaking at about 9.5 a billion people on this planet from today's perspective. And since in many countries the young ones are already better educated than the old ones, uh, the, the continuation of the trend would result in quite some improvement of human capital. And given all the good things that we discussed of human capital, uh, this is really a quite optimistic view of the world and I think a reason for optimism. Uh, it can even go better. The SSP1 is the rapid social development. There we have a much faster expansion of education, and that's also called the sustainability scenario. But there may also be a stalled development if there are political unrest, uh, let's say in Africa, uh, civil wars or other problems that stop the further expansion of education. Then we may indeed up with a stagnated situation. And since less educated women have more children, uh, world population may also reach uh, 12 billion or more. So a good progress is likely, but it's not guaranteed. And that's what these different scenarios show us. And I've mentioned Nathan Kiffitt. So at his 100th birthday, we had this massive 1,000-page volume with Oxford University Press giving these alternative scenarios uh, for all countries in the world and summarizing the state of knowledge. Uh, here you see alternative 
age pyramids for the 2050, the SSP1, the very rapid uh, development changes the world pyramid to a highly educated and essentially the, all of the world on average would look like Europe looks today. Or if we have the stagnation, then we would have uh, still very sizable uneducated populations and a much bigger world population size. Uh, a word on migration, since we really don't have time, and I'm sure in the questions you want to ask, this is the third component. Migration is a big topic, and I'm just saying that YASA and the Joint Research Center of the European Commission has just started a new center of expertise where we try to apply these multidimensional assessments of different possible future populations um, to the push factors out of Africa and Western Asia and the pull factors of an aging Europe and uh, then uh, assess the longer-term impact of different migration scenarios by age, gender, but also by education and labor force participation. And just to highlight that also for labor force participation, this matters here, you have the European average of female labor force participation. You see dark blue, tertiary educated women, they almost all of them after the end of their study work and they retire later already now than the others. And then you see in yellow, uh, the lower only with basic education, uh, they start out at a much lower level of working. Many of them don't return after having children and they tend to retire earlier. So the educational change, the fact that the future population is going to be better educated than today, and uh, if we have these patterns of labor force participation by education, will lead to some increases in the workforce. And this is some of the things that we kind of consider here. In conclusion, coming to the world uh, goals, the, you all may have heard that the uh, after the Millennium Development Goals from 2000 to 2015. Now in 2015, all leaders of the world came together and um, decided what was probably based on the most inclusive ever consultation process in human history. There were tens of thousands of groups discussing these goals in many countries of the world. And as a consequence, of course, we had different pressure groups uh, pushing for different goals. So you have these 17 goals that are very broad. Actually, they are more specific in 169 targets. And uh, the question is now, will these goals actually be implemented? The governments have said they would do. And uh, recently, now the UN has made an important decision. They, have said they appoint an independent group of scientists, so 15 scientists, to be sort of the watchdogs, to see and supervise the assessment process over the next three years of the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. And um, so in, in the past, the governments decided themselves whether they've met their goals. Now the scientists objectively should judge uh, whether these goals have been met. And I've just received a letter from the Secretary General last week that I should be one of these 15 scientists, so that's a daunting task, and I will need a lot of help in doing this, and sort of the, the two main challenges I see here is one, that there's no clear sense of priorities. I mean, these 17 goals are all over the place, and they're partly contradicting each other, partly overlapping, and the, yeah, the, the second problem is also that many particular developing countries are quite reluctant to accept any advice from the former colonial powers, they say development assistance generally has done more harm than good. We want to do our own business. Uh, don't impose anything on us. And uh, viewing these two things together, as I said, I'm really rethinking now this, this paper uh, and this principle. It's actually, the principle alludes to Martin Luther, who is celebrating next year 500 years of reformation. And he had this famous solar principle, solar scola, solar fide and sort of you should focus on the essential and, and not being corrupted by the other things. So here uh, there is the, the focus on basic education and basic health as something that is empowering people around the world. It is not imposing a specific agenda. It's not enhancing corruption in developing countries as many of these big infrastructure projects do, but it's focusing only on the empowerment of people. Uh, and that is valid for all countries of the world. And it's also valid, and this is the new thing about the SDGs, about ourselves, about the industrialized countries. I recently participated in a, a seven academy statement run by the German Leopoldina on uh, challenges of population aging. 
And there is a remarkable sentence here that also in the European policies, in terms of massive demographic change, there should be found ways to reduce material consumption and at the same time to grow in quality and extent of education, health, and living conditions. So it's also for our future lifestyle that is more environmentally benign. It is really education and health that could be prior focuses. And I just want to conclude with the statement that I often make in the context of uh, environmental meetings, really brain power is the zero emissions solution and energy for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you.